The psalmist wrote in Psalm 126, verse 3, The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. And as we come back to Noah today, that was surely the attitude of Noah's, in Noah's heart before the Lord. God had done great things for him, and he was bound to be glad. And you think of the last hundred years or so of Noah's life, things have been tough. There was hard work, undoubtedly, to obey God, to build the ark, to do so in the face of scorn and criticism and mockery um, from the people who were all around him. And then the last year of Noah's life has been utterly terrifying because after entering into that ark, the door was closed and the most dreadful judgment ever to hit this world uh, arrived. And the multitudes who were outside the door uh, survived, or, or were destroyed. And although Noah survived and was safe in the ark, I'm sure there were plenty of unpleasant things to deal with. I'm sure there were plenty of worries and stresses to deal with as he maybe heard the noise of the water beating against the outer walls of the ark. And he's very aware that all it takes is one leak in this, in this vessel and all could come to ruin. I know God has promised great things to Noah and Noah would reassure his heart with the promises of God. But you know what we're all like, even though we have God's promises, does doubt and fear and worry not creep in so quickly and surely Noah was just the same as as you and me a man of like passions and um, to ourselves and he's very conscious of the danger outside and all that's keeping him safe well yes is the Lord and you dare not say all that's keeping you safe but in terms of physically all keeping him safe is some wood uh, the outer walls of, of the ark but after all the ordeal the Lord has done great things for him and surely he was glad because as we pick things up now, we find him with the ark resting on dry ground. In fact, ultimately the door is opened and at the command of God, he's called to go forth into the new world. All those years ago, Noah had been warned of this terrible judgment that was coming. He was told what had to be done. Times have been tough, but he's been brought through it all now. He's been saved. And as we come to this section at the end of chapter 8, we're showing something of Noah's response, uh, Noah's reaction to what God has done for him, Noah's reaction to salvation. And it's, it's a, that theme that I want to look at with you today. It's relevant to the people of God because we, like Noah, have been rescued, maybe not from a literal flood in an ark, but we have been rescued. We've been saved through faith in Christ so much so that we can stand today with confidence in the Savior. We can stand today knowing that, yes, the judgment of God, uh, the great final judgment is coming. Yes, that all will stand before the throne. But yet we can stand confident we are safe for that day. In fact, we're already saved. We're already justified. We're already right with God. The Lord has already done great things for us. And how should we respond? What should our reaction be? Um, to salvation. So we're looking at Noah's response to salvation uh, today. And the first thing I want to stress is that Noah responded with obedience. He responded with obedience. Now throughout this whole account, we've been given not just the general story of the flood, as I've stressed before, because this is a historical account, we are given particular dates and times. The the actual chronology of when things happened and what day they took place. And I think there's something very interesting to notice when you look at verse 13 through to, well, 19. Uh, to give you the background, uh, verse 4 of this chapter told us that the ark finally rested upon the mountains of Ararat on the 17th day of the seventh month of the year. That's when the ark touched down on the ground. But obviously it was still going to be a while until the floodwaters dried up. Well, verse 13 fast forwards uh, another number of months. And it's now New Year's Day. It's the first day of the first month of the 601st year of Noah's life. New Year's Day in verse 13. And on that day, Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And behold, the face of the ground was dry. So what's Noah going to do now? He's looking out. He sees that the ground is dry. What's he going to do? I think that most of us, 
and certainly including myself here, if we were in his shoes, we would be very tempted to open the door of the ark and to start disembarking. There you are, the ark's on dry ground, I've lifted the cover off, I'm looking down, I can see with my own eyes, the ground is dry. It's time to get out of these cramped conditions. So what does Noah do? Well, Noah does nothing. In fact, he does nothing for quite some time. Uh, Verse 14, fast forwards again. And it's now the 27th day of the second month. So nearly two months have passed since Noah looked out of the ark and he saw that the ground was dry. And what's he been doing in those two months? Nothing. At least nothing in terms of leaving the ark. Uh, At this point, it's nearly two months later than when he first saw the ground was dry. And it's now that God speaks to Noah in verse 15 and tells him to leave the ark. And so now, Noah leaves. Now, the basic thing I'm pointing out there is that for nearly two months, Noah can see with his own two eyes that the ground is dry. Why does he not leave the ark? Well, I suggest it's because God had told him to go into that ark before the flood, and the Lord had not yet told him to leave. Although he sees the ground is dry... Although perhaps you could say common sense tells him to get out, the Lord has not told him to go yet. The Lord has not given the instruction. And the fact that Noah was willing to wait all that time in the uncomfortable conditions of the ark, because remember, this is not a five-star hotel. This is uh, a survival vessel. And it's involved with all those, I think we mentioned last week, all those smells of the animals. It's an unpleasant uh, conditions to be in. He's determined to remain there all that time. Because he wants to walk in step with the Lord. He wants to be obedient to the Lord. He doesn't want to rush ahead of the Lord. But he wants the Lord's direction. His longing is to obey his God. And I suggest to you that in a large part that flows out of the great deliverance that God has wrought for him. Now he was obeying God before the flood. So he he was obedient then too. But all the more now he's got reason to obey God in light of the great things that God has done for him. First of all, you know, when you think of this desire to obey the Lord, surely we can say that salvation gave Noah an obligation to obey God. Gave him an obligation to obey God. He knows that his life has been spared, and spared purely because of the grace found in the eyes of the Lord. God did not need to save Noah. God didn't owe anything to Noah. Noah didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it when God saved him from the flood. God was gracious. The Lord was good to him. And the fact that God has graciously spared him, it it, it surely emphasizes the point to Noah's heart that, that everything he has, everything that he is, all that he might enjoy, every blessing on earth that he can experience now, all of this flows to him purely from the goodness of God. How can Noah possibly hold back obedience from the Lord who has done so much for him? And that ought to be the response in us. Certainly for the child of God, that ought to be our response. I mean, even on a physical level, can we not say God God could have taken our lives long ago in judgment and ushered us out into eternity? But not only has he prolonged our lives, the Lord has already through Christ saved us from the condemnation of the law, from uh, death, from hell that we were due to face. The Lord has done great things for us and all of his blessings flow to us from his grace. Blessings that we haven't earned. And surely the attitude of the child of God therefore ought to be that since the Lord has done great things for me, how can I withhold obedience from him how can i withhold service to my god how can i live life for myself now going my way when the lord has done such great things for me that's certainly how the apostle paul uh, spoke in romans 12 verse 1 he spoke first of all in romans throughout romans essentially sets forth the gospel right the way through in great detail Uh, paul paul had spoken about the mercies of god all the way through and he He mentions them again then in Romans 12, verse 1. And he says to the people of God, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
He's saying, in light of all that God has done for us, in light of the wonderful salvation through Jesus Christ, let us present all that we are upon the altar. Not to earn anything, not to make a name for ourselves, not because we want to try and be the extra special Christian, but simply because this is our reasonable service. This is what surely ought to be given to the God and Savior who has done so much for us. Let us lay down our lives on the altar, he says, essentially, because it's the right thing to do. God has done everything for you in Christ, blessed you with an abundance of blessings, saved you from death and hell. It's reasonable to lay down the entirety of your life on his altar and serve him. Live in obedience to the Lord. Live for his glory. You know, in connection with the reasonableness of obeying God and, and serving the Lord, Noah surely recognizes that God's judgment came against the old world because men had been living in rebellion, refusing to obey the Lord. And God, by this great salvation, has now made all things new for Noah and has ushered Noah into a new world. Noah is, is very aware that God has not made all things new just so that he can go back to living the way the old world lived. Noah is saved onto something better. He's saved now for the purpose of living with new obedience, where wickedness prevailed through the earth and brought the judgment of God. Now in its place, righteousness and true holiness is to prevail in the world through Noah. And so it ought to be with us. When God has saved you, he has saved you that you might walk with newness of life, you're, you're a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things are made new. And, and that is not done just so that you can go back to living the old way. You're saved to live with new obedience unto the Lord. In Romans 6, Paul answered the question of whether a believer can carry on living in sin. And I suppose the tempting answer to say is, well, yes, yeah, sure you can. Because sure, God's grace is why, why we're saved. His mercy is greater than our sin. So well, so sure, continue living in sin and God can still forgive you. That might be what you're tempted to say. Well, Paul says, absolutely not. God forbid. He explains that through faith in union with Christ, we've, we've died to the old life. We have, as it were, been, been buried with Christ. Our, our old existence is in the grave. And just as Christ was literally raised from the grave, so, as it were, we, we have been resurrected in Christ onto newness of life. Ephesians 4 Begins by calling believers to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called. And a little later in chapter 22, it tells us then how to do that. We're to, we're to put off concerning the, the former conversation. Uh, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. He's saying put off the old way of life. Put off the old sins. Put off the old way of conducting yourself. And you're not just to put off, but you're to put on. Put on, in Ephesians 4.24, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When God has brought you into new life through Christ, it is that you might walk worthy of him, that you might walk with him, that you might put off the old way, the old way of sin, and doing things your own way, and put on the new, a life of righteousness and holiness, and live unto God. That's what you're saved for. To live on to him. And again, when you think of all that God has done for you, if you're saved today, delivering you from death, from hell, doing so through the costly work of the cross, is there anything that you can legitimately hold back from the Lord? Is there any area of life at all where you have the right to say to God now, no, I'll do it my way, thanks. Surely there's, there's no area where we can respond like that. Salvation puts an obligation on us. God has done so much for us through Christ. Our lives surely must be laid on the altar in obedience to him. So salvation gave Noah an obligation to obey God. But not only that, his salvation also gave Noah the motivation to obey the Lord. Why should Noah wait for the word of God when he's there in the ark and he can see with his own two eyes that the ground is dry, why should he obey God and seek to walk the Lord's way? 
Well, in part because he owes it to the Lord. The Lord has done so much for him. But on top of that, as you think of what the Lord has done for Noah, surely there's great motivation to obey God and and trust the Lord's direction. See, in past days when God graciously revealed himself to Noah and prompted Noah to build the ark, and when God ruled over the affairs of the world so that when the waters swallowed up everything else that that Noah and his family and those in the ark were kept secure, in all of these dealings, God has been revealing his heart for Noah. The Lord has given wonderful demonstration to the fact that he cares for Noah, that he loves Noah. In fact, every past instruction has been for Noah's good, telling him to build the ark and gather the food and and so on. God's instructions in the past have been for his good, and God's rule over all that has happened has been for Noah's good. In God's work, saving him from the flood, the Lord has proved fairly conclusively his love for Noah. And since, since Noah has now received great evidence of the heart of God toward him, surely he has every, every reason, every motivation to believe that God's instruction, God's leading, God's commands, his guidance will continue to be for his good. You know, a sheep will follow its shepherd who has faithfully stood with it already and proved himself much quicker than it follows a stranger who's just come into the field and whose intentions are unknown. If you're a, a servant employed to obey your master and you don't trust your master's motives, you don't have any sense that your master cares for you, that your boss has any concern for you, well, I, I suspect you'll have a harder time following his instruction or her instruction and obeying the commands when you don't know that they're going to be for, for your good. It might bring you down. It might, might hurt you. What a difference when you think of obeying the Lord. When you can trust that the one who gives you the instructions cares for you. He desires your good. He, he loves you. He's proven it. Noah is sure of the love of God to him. The Lord has proven it. Doing so much, revealing himself to Noah, bringing Noah through the flood. The Lord has proven his love. How much more motivation there is then to obey the good and the loving instruction of the Lord. On the the first day of the new year, as Noah removed the covering of the ark and he looks out and he sees that the land looks dry and he's already aware that there are plants growing, that there's an olive branch that the, the dove brought back, he might think to himself that he can safely leave the ark. So he, he might be tempted to just go on ahead, even though God hasn't told him to leave yet. He might wonder to himself over those days, why has God not given me the order to go? Why is the Lord leaving me in this ark for all this extra time when the land is dry? He might not understand that. But he has good evidence in what God has already done for him in the past. That the Lord cares for him. That the Lord loves him. That that the Lord is not just leaving him in that ark for no reason. There is a wise, there is a loving purpose behind it. And so Noah has every motivation to obey. You know, likewise for we who know Christ, and we've been saved from death and hell through him, not only does the gospel obligate us, give us a responsibility to obey the Lord, but surely it also gives us every motivation we would need to obey God and live life the Lord's way. There may well be times when Satan would come to you and tempt you to distrust the Lord. I mean, that's what he did with Adam and Eve. He tempted them. You know, can you really trust God? Does he really want your good? He's told you not to eat from the fruit of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But can you really trust that that's for your good? Sure, God just doesn't want you to be like him. God wants to hold you back. That's how Satan tempted Eve. You can't trust the intentions of God. And Satan does that with you and me at times too. Can we trust the instruction of the Lord? Can we really with confidence say, yes, obeying God will lead to blessing. Obeying God will be good for me. Can we really say that with confidence? Will you stop and think what the Lord has already done for you? You think of the lengths that he has gone to to save you from hell. You think of the disaster that God has spared you from at immense cost as Christ laid down his life there at the cross. 
You have every reason to trust him that his intentions for you are good. You have every reason to take him at his word, to rest in his promises, to follow his instructions, obey his commands. Every reason to go through with God, even if you don't fully understand why the Lord's way is the best way. You've got every reason to go on with God, to follow him. Because you've got every evidence you need that his intentions for you are good. His instructions then are good. His direction will never bring you down. In fact, for those of us who've been saved any length of time, I think most of us can look back over the years of walking with the Lord and we can see that obeying God has never once brought us down. Now, it might have brought us into troubles. It might have, might have brought us difficulties at, at times, depending on, on what we're talking about. But it's always brought us real joy in our soul. It's always brought us real blessedness and, and joy. It is disobedience that has always brought us misery. It's when we've neglected the word of God. It's when we've gone our own way, when we've done our own thing. That, that's when we've had misery. That, that's when we've had maybe seasons of a depressed spirit, a depressed soul. That, that's when we've had seasons of real distress and not knowing how we can dig ourselves out of the hole we've gotten ourselves into. It's disobedience that leads to trouble. Obeying God, the child of God who's walked with the Lord for any length of time, we can testify. Obeying God has never brought us trouble. See, his commands, his instructions, his direction is always for our good. He's proven it when he proved his love for us at Calvary. The Savior himself said to his people in John 15, verse 9, he said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. You just think of that statement, how wonderful that is. You think of how the Father has loved him. You're talking about love from all of eternity, infinite love. Is there any limit to the love of the Father for the Son? Surely not. But Christ says, as the Father loves me, has loved me, I have loved you. We can't even plumb the depths of that. We can't get to the end of the length and breadth and depth and height of that. I have loved you. And Christ has proved it when he laid down his life for you. As you think of the evidence for his remarkable love delivering you from your sin and from judgment, should it not prompt you to prompt us all to gladly and joyfully submit to the will of God even when we don't understand? Like Noah, there in the ark for two months, not sure why he hasn't been told to leave yet. The Lord's way is good. He's proven his heart. And so Noah responds with obedience. And is that how you're responding to the Lord today? Especially you who know him, who know his salvation. Are you willing to say, I, I might not understand, but I know my Lord. He is worthy of my obedience. He has shown that it is no foolish thing to obey him, to go his way. So I will follow him. Noah responded with obedience. I want you to notice as well that Noah responded with worship. He responded with obedience, but he also responded with worship. I think it's very appropriate that the very first thing that Noah did when he disembarked was to build an altar onto the Lord. In verse 20, as soon as he gets off the ark, you've got the details of the animals and so on coming off. As soon as they get off the ark, he offered sacrifice to God. He erected the altar and sacrificed. Now, it's quite likely that Noah had been desperately missing the worship of God in that form. I, we're not told, but I, I strongly suspect that there was not burnt offerings being offered on the ark itself. You would imagine that just couldn't be done. And so, as soon as he can, Noah is taking this first opportunity to get back to his practice of publicly worshipping the Lord, and doing so in the way that God has appointed in that time, by erecting the altar and offering the appropriate sacrifices. His first instinct, following this wonderful salvation, is to worship God, and even to worship God publicly. And you know, that, that's very appropriate. So too, surely, surely for you and me who know salvation in Christ, one of the most fundamental ways in which we ought to respond is with a heart of, of worship. For our God. In fact, fundamentally, we who are saved are saved to worship. That's one of the chief reasons why God saves you, that you might be a worshiper. 
throughout Scripture. That's the natural response at every point of deliverance, whether it's Noah getting off the ark and worshipping God, or whether it's the children of Israel rejoicing and worshipping the Lord on the far bank of the Red Sea after deliverance from Egypt, whether it's maybe the people of God in the days of Ezra, when God has brought them back from captivity and the foundation of the temple is laid again and there's hope and they, they worship God. Trace the history in Scripture, you'll find that deliverance from God always brings forth worship from God's people. And, in fact, Scripture gives us a little peek at the end of all things. And, and what do you find in eternity? You find an all-glorious God, an all-glorious Lamb upon the throne, Christ, and you find an abundance of worshippers lifting their voices together, praising the Redeemer. What will be the chief occupation for us in eternity? What will be our, our primary thing? It'll be worship. Worship will be central. And what ought to be our chief occupation now? Again, worship. All of the Christian's life ought to flow out of a heart of worship from the God who has delivered us. And since all of life is to flow from an attitude of worship, surely also we could say there, there ought to be set seasons, like even today, where we, we set aside time and we, we gather to publicly worship God, as Noah did when he erected this altar. He, he responded with worship. He was very quick to do so. God has done great things to me, so I will worship him. Now, now think just for a moment of what that involved as he engaged in this public worship of God. Uh, first of all, it involved thankfulness. Thankfulness. Uh, by offering these animals, Noah is acknowledging that the Lord has done great things for him. He is returning certain things onto God, acknowledging the goodness of God. He's, he's thankful. He's recognizing very publicly, God has brought me through. God has brought our family through this great judgment. The Lord has done great things for us. He's acknowledging it as he offers these animals onto God. His worship expresses a heart that overflows with thankfulness. Now it's worth, of course, noticing that Noah does not just offer public prayer to God. He doesn't just sing to the Lord. He specifically offers sacrifices to God. He took from each of the clean animals that had been on board the ark, and he sacrificed, I presume, one of each kind onto God. And that was the way God had appointed for his public worship at that time. But it also shows you Noah's awareness of the, the foundation upon which he had been spared. Remember, Noah was saved from the flood, not because he deserved it, not because he was better than others. He was saved because he found grace in the eyes of God. And as he offers these burnt offerings to God, sacrificing the clean animals, these things point him to look forward with the eye of faith to the promised Redeemer, to the true Lamb of God, who would sacrificially lay down his life for Noah. Why was Noah spared? Why did he find grace with God? It's because of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's because Christ would bear Noah's guilt and sin upon the cross. And so as Noah offers this sacrifice, he's He's publicly demonstrating his thankfulness, but not just that God has brought him through the flood. He's thankful for the Redeemer. He's thankful for a way of salvation whereby his sin can be cleansed by the shedding of blood. He's thankful for the fullness of God's great salvation, salvation from his sin and from judgment. This worship flows from a heart that is thankful in Christ, thankful for the promised Christ who was to come. And certainly as we live our lives, and then especially as we think about gathering for worship, is that not where it all ought to flow from? A heart that is thankful, rejoicing in the Christ who has now come and who has now delivered us from all our, our trouble and has redeemed us unto God. Do you get up on the Lord's Day maybe, maybe aware that you should go to church, aware that you should gather for worship? It's the right thing to do. But sort of some weeks you're just sort of going through the motions, just going because you know you should, singing along with the hymns because you know you should, listening to the preaching because, again, you, you know you should. Or are you gathered today with a heart of joy and a heart that truly is thankful? Christ has redeemed me. 
Christ has bought me back from my sin. He's rescued me from hell. Praise him. Praise him. May the Lord continually kindle thankfulness in our hearts because of how he deserves our thanks for all that he has done. Noah responded with thankful worship for God. He is saying, for all the Lord has done for me, I never will cease to praise him. This worship involved thankfulness. It also involved proclamation. Proclamation. The offering of the sacrifices, it had a Godward element. It was directed to the Lord as he thanks the Lord, as he draws on to God through Christ. But there is also a, a manward element. You see, there was, a, there was a proclamation in these sacrifices that ought to be received by men. These sacrifices, they were, they were very physical declarations of the gospel. In some way, I suppose, when you think of the physical aspect of them, they function a little bit like the Lord's table, the, the bread and the, and the cup, uh, physical proclamations of, of the gospel. Uh, these these sacrifices, the, the death and the bloodshed of the clean animals, it pointed forward to the perfect Lamb of God, the Redeemer, who, who would come and lay down his life. The sacrifices proclaimed that there was forgiveness for sin through that perfect sacrifice. And they therefore proclaimed the very ground of deliverance, uh, which was Christ himself. You could say these sacrifices were, were preaching Christ. That's what they were doing. And so as Noah steps out into this new world with new God-given life and he offers the sacrifices, he does so, yes, thankful, but also determined that Christ will be seen. He's determined that the Savior will be proclaimed. Now, now I, I know Noah didn't know all the details of Christ the way we do. We, we're aware of the gospel with New Testament revelation as well. But Noah was resting in the promise of the seed of the woman. As we've seen through Genesis, he was resting in this promised Messiah who would come. And as he comes to the sacrifice, Christ is set before him. Christ is proclaimed. And of course, that's the greatest need of his day or of any day, that Christ would be proclaimed. No one needed that for his own heart. No one needed Christ proclaimed to his own heart. He might have been brought through the flood, but remember, Noah isn't a perfect man. He's still a sinner saved by grace. He has faults and failures still present with him. He's still prone to sin against the Lord, even though he's pursuing obedience. And so as he will proceed through this new lease of life that he has in the new world, he himself needs, he needs a constant reminder of the cleansing and the forgiveness that there is through the Redeemer. By erecting the altar and offering the sacrifices, Noah is proclaiming, first of all, to his own heart, where his hope lies. He's proclaiming to his own heart the things of Christ. Establishing the sacrifice straight away, and presumably continuing with them throughout his life, he's continually bringing his own heart back to consider Christ. And of course, as we respond to God's salvation, and we live in newness of life through faith in Christ, that too is our constant need. That's our ongoing need, that Christ would be proclaimed afresh again and again and again to our hearts. We continually need to be drawn back to behold the one who is sufficient for us. So that when we're, when we're feeling overwhelmed by sin at times, that our soul is continually brought back to, to be reminded that Christ is greater than all of our sin. His salvation is sufficient to put away all our sin. When our hearts start to get wayward and we lose that spark of love for the Lord that there ought to be there, we need our hearts to continually be drawn back to the gospel that we might see the love of God afresh and that we might have then love rekindled within ourselves. We, we don't start the Christian life at the cross and then go on and leave it behind and move on to better things. We respond to salvation, to God's deliverance by continually going back to the cross continually having Christ proclaimed afresh to us and that is one of our chief needs that's one of the chief things happening as we gather for public worship we're not moving past the gospel we're not moving on to deeper and more interesting bits and pieces of theology and, and leaving the gospel to the side no 
We come primarily to feed upon Christ. We come primarily to see more of him, to be reminded afresh of all that he is, his glory and his work on our behalf and all that we have in him. We need a sight of him continually. That's what Noah was receiving because this sacrifice proclaimed Christ to his heart. And of course, as Noah offered the sacrifice, he wasn't just proclaiming Christ to his own heart, but he was proclaiming Christ to his whole family circle who were with him. As he rejoiced in his deliverance, and not just from the flood, but his deliverance from sin and death and hell, his longing, even as he worshipped, was that others might see much of Christ and go on with the Savior. As he publicly built this altar and he worshipped God in thankfulness because God is worthy of worship, yes, also to do so, to do his own heart good, as he rests upon the Savior, he also does so that Christ might be seen by others. Even his family. There weren't many others around, admittedly, but there were some others. There were his family. The family needed to know more of Christ. The family needed to have the things of Christ set before them. They weren't all saved either. They needed the gospel. As he erects the altar, Noah is proclaiming to them, the ground of his hope. And he is pointing them through all that God has ordained here with the sacrifices. He's pointing them to the Redeemer. And surely for any of us who know the Lord's salvation, who've received deliverance through Christ, is that not also meant to be one of our chief desires as we respond to what God has done for us? We rejoice in his deliverance for us and therefore surely our desire is that the world might know our Lord, that Christ might be lifted up before the eyes of our family or our loved ones or our community, that his name would be proclaimed, that the world might look at him and see one who is worthy of their worship and their obedience and their heart. And so I wonder today, just as Noah, with purpose, stepped off the ark, and in the eyes of all his family, he gave thanks to God, and he publicly professed the things of God, the things of Christ. Is there the same desire drive, even even purpose in you and me, that the Savior to whom we owe everything, the one who deserves our obedience, the one who has proven his love to us, the Savior who is to be thanked and praised, the one who nourishes us and keeps us right through to eternity, is it our desire that he would be lifted up and that the world would be drawn onto him? Are we laboring to that end? As Noah rejoices in his deliverance, his desire is that not only he, but his whole family circle and all around him, that they might too know Christ and go on with Christ. How good it is today if you know the salvation of God. And as we see Noah respond to salvation with humble submission to the will of God, obedience to the leading of the Lord, and with thankful Christ exalting worship how are you responding today to god's salvation is your life on the altar today which is your reasonable service is your life being lived out of a heart of worship worship for the christ is he being lifted up and proclaimed through your life for he's worthy what a savior we have may we respond aright our God's salvation. Amen.